right, 1 Kings chapter 3. I tell you, I'm going to try to play a little something here before we... It's been a long time since I've done anything with the harmonica, so I thought I'd try to do something tonight. If you'll bear with me a little bit and put up with it a little bit, I'll try to play something a little bit. I'll try anyway. guys know um, it's a classical piece. What's it called? Jesus, Joy of Man's Desire. Anybody know that? Heard of that? We'll try to do a little bit of that. <laughs> All right, First Kings chapter 3, I love that piece. I don't do very good well playing it, but I like it. Amen. Amen. If you can do something, I've been under conviction about some of that lately. If you can do a little something, you ought to do it. Amen. And so uh, if I can do it, you can do it. So that's the idea with all that. First Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter 3, what does it make a joyful noise unto the Lord? Amen. First Kings chapter 3, and this is a very um, peculiar passage, I've preached some of this before, it's been quite, quite some time, so <clears throat> I want to look at some of these things again tonight. Of course Solomon here, he comes in, he's going to be king, and uh, he has taken the throne there, uh, you see uh, uh, the first of uh, first chapter, second chapter, Solomon is being established in his kingdom. Um, there's some some heads are rolling, if you will, literally. And uh, he gets to chapter three, and Solomon here asked for wisdom. He asked for wisdom wisdom to rule his people, rule God's people, and uh, the Lord's going to grant him that because he did because he asked a good thing. And uh, that's a good thing if a ruler was to ask for wisdom instead of power or for his agenda and all that stuff, which what you got a lot going on today, a lot of corruption. And, of course, Solomon in his early part of his reign here, a perfect type of Christ and the millennial reign of Jesus Christ and, and so on and so forth. But then you get an illustration here of these two women, these two harlot women. And uh, to me, this thing is just real odd that, I don't know, it's just odd. Uh, with these two women that come, they happen to be harlots and all that. I mean, of all, of all the scenarios, I mean, Solomon is king, and I'll, I guarantee you stuff was being brought to him for judgment, and he was making judgments, and uh, righteous judgments, no doubt, at this time. But the Lord decides to use this peculiar uh, illustration here and maybe it's because uh, the sword is involved and there's the exaltation of the sword and the word of God. Uh, other than that it just seems like a real odd strange thing to me. I don't know about you but 
even even the uh, the whole scenario uh, is just it's just strange to me. I'm not I'm not. Um, do you ever read the Bible and look at that and go, huh? That's weird. You ever do that? Well, this is one of those for me. I look at it and I go, that's just weird, man. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, here it is, and the things that were written aforetime were written for our admonition, our learning, so on and so forth, comfort, and uh, all that stuff. So I want to look at this passage, verse 16 down to the end of the chapter, and we'll see here some effects of the sword, some effects of the sword. And obviously, taking this sword and making some application to uh, the Word of God. There's no question when you get the sword out, uh, something's going to happen. When you get the Bible out, something's going to happen. Uh, I, I like that verse over there where the word of a king is, there is power. And it's a, it's a, it shouldn't be no surprise to you that when people begin to talk about different versions of the Bible and this and that and the other, you'll find that the King James Bible does stand out and does stand above all of the others. And uh, there's no question about that because it's, it belongs to God. It's the king's. It's his. And where the word of a king is, there's power. They, they always want to compare to the King James Bible. Um, and none of the rest of them. They don't compare it to the Koran. They don't compare anything like that. And they say, well, this, those aren't Bibles. and all. I understand all that, but as far as sacred writings, if you will, holy books. None of that stuff is compared to uh, the Shastas and the Korans and, and whatever else have you. They don't compare it to the New World Translation. <laughs> they don't compare it to the Book of Mormons. None of that. They don't compare their Bibles to those other, if you will, I don't even want to call them sacred books, holy books. They're not. Uh, all of those other uh, uh, so-called Bibles and writings and all that stuff. It's always compared to the, the, the King James Bible. And w when you get it out, I tell you, uh, something is going to happen. And um, we know that uh, the Lord uh, says over there in Isaiah, chapter 55, when His Word goes out, it doesn't return void. Don't, don't ever be ashamed or don't ever be afraid to put the Bible out there. Don't ever be, as a matter of fact, if, if you're trying to be a soul winner, uh, don't be afraid to get your Bible out. Don't be afraid to quote the Bible. I mean, that's our, that's our source. That's our weapon. That's our foundation. That's, our, that's the, the power that we possess is found in the pages of the Word of God. And when you put that thing out there, uh, the Holy Spirit of God will bear witness to that thing. And he'll use it. And I know maybe some of this is real, maybe you've heard all this tonight and all that. I'm just trying to encourage you a little bit uh, concerning the uh, effects of the sword of the Word of God. And uh, like I said, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed to put it out there. Let's read and then we'll, we'll get on down through here with some of this. Verse number 16. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. Of course, the king being Solomon. And the one woman said, O my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered that this woman was delivered also. No stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. All right, these, these babies born three days apart. And this woman's child died in the night, verse 19, because she, <coughs> excuse me, overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. And when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this, said, uh, and this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Then they spake before the king. Or excuse me, thus they spake before the king. So you can see what's going on here. They're squabbling and, and quarreling and fussing here. And uh, I guess maybe the one lady here has a legitimate gripe. Amen. I mean, she stole her baby for crying out loud. 
after uh, hers, the other, uh, that is, died. Uh, and so here they are before the king. And uh, man, have you ever been in a circumstance where uh, some, something was brought to you, you need to make a decision, you don't know what to do? That, I mean, what would you do in this case? You don't know you weren't there. And you know somebody's lying, but you can't figure out who it is. <laughs> Amen? Man, I hate that kind of stuff. I have a tendency to drop the hammer on everybody when that happens. <laughs> and that ain't always good, you know. That ain't, that ain't always good. Verse 23, then, yeah, then said the king, here we go. The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. Uh, it doesn't take Solomon long here. This thing, obviously, this, this, this kind of uh, wisdom is given to him by God. I mean, and the king said, I mean, he doesn't waste time here. And the king said, bring me a sword. <laughs> and, they brought, and they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child. And in no wise slay it, but the other said, Let it be neither thy, uh, mine or thine, but divide it. That always amazed me, right, that right there. The first response doesn't surprise me. But that second one surprises me. That she would even, okay, you might think that. I mean, already, I mean, neither one of these women got the best going for them. They're both harlots. But the one here, I mean, her child dies and she steals, she kidnaps, she steals somebody else's kid. And now she's before a king, Solomon, I mean, the king. And he's telling, giving the command to do what he's saying to do. And then you give a response like this. That, that, that amazes me. Let it, let it be neither mine or thine, but divide it. I mean, what profit is that? I mean, what good, what, unless she's just so full of envy, so full of, of hatred and spite and bitterness and all that. That's the only legitimate or logical reason you can think of. Let it neither be mine or thine. She just don't care. But divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. Obviously the first there. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him, look at that, to do judgment. Obviously you know that the Bible uh, is likened to a sword. You find that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and you'll find that also in Psalm 149, verse 6, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You're very familiar with those passages, I'm sure. Probably don't even have to quote them. You might even be sitting there trying to quote it in your head. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Two-edged sword in her hand over there in Psalm 149. Um, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword there in Hebrews chapter 4. So we have no, there's no doubt, there's no doubt, what, we know what we're dealing with here when, it, when we're talking about the sword, the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Word of God. And boy, what a sword that is. I mean, that, that is a sword like you've never, never seen. And so, and, and the king here, he, he, he calls for the sword. And he calls for the sword because he's sitting in judgment. He's got to do some discernment. He's got to do some deciphering. He's got to make some decisions. He needs some understanding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's got a, he's got a hard situation here. And uh, he calls for the sword. You've got a hard situation Man, go to the Bible. Go to the Bible. There's nothing wrong. Don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with seeking counsel. There's nothing, but be careful who you seek counsel with. There's nothing wrong with going to someone who um, would give all impression. You know, they're trying to walk with God and trying to have a relationship with the Lord and trying to be somewhat in step with God somewhere along the line. 
and, 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 and maybe spiritually minded, if you will, uh, toward the things of God and the Bible and that kind of stuff and uh, trying to live by this book and practical book and maybe has lived some life and down the road and been through some things and understand some things and has seen God work in their life. Nothing wrong with going to someone and asking for counsel or advice or anything like that. But, man, don't, don't throw out God's Word. Don't, don't throw it out. I think, I think too many times we sell the Bible short. Too many times we sell the Bible short. We say, well, you know, I've read this, I've read that. I've, uh, just keep reading. You'd be amazed. I've said this before, but you would be amazed at what God will give you in your systematic daily reading. You would be amazed at what God will reveal to you just if you just be faithful and just try to read your Bible faithfully. You'd be amazed at how God will speak to your heart. He will speak to your heart. I, I guarantee you He will speak to your heart. If He don't, I will, I will shut up. I will close this book and get out of this pulpit. I am that sure that God Almighty will speak to your heart if you will systematically read that book. I, I just I know for a fact He will. I've seen Him do it. I've heard too many testimonies of Him doing it. I know God will do this. God bears witness to His Word. And I know in this room tonight... I'm not the only one, and you're not the only one, and there are hard circumstances, situations, things, and it may be a lot, sometimes it's stuff people don't even know about. And you're praying on it, and you're seeking God's face and seeking God's will and, and all of that. Just stay in the book, stay in the book, and God, God will give you some answers. Amen. All right, now I want to say three, four or five things here, four or five things and uh, about this. And some of these are kind of uh, maybe obvious, evident, uh, obviously, uh, glaringly obvious in the passage and all this. But number one, I want you to notice this sword is a divider. It's a divider. Number two, I want you to notice this sword is a discerner. A discerner. And you, these are common. Uh, number three, I want you to notice that this sword is a deterrent. A deterrent. And then number four, this sword... Uh, forces a decision. It will force a decision. You will have to make a decision. Number one, it's a divider. We know the verse over there in Hebrews 4.12 uh, about the Word of God dividing and so on and so forth. The Word of God is, there's no question, it's a divider. If you're going to get around Jesus Christ, you might as well expect some things. And one of those things that's going to happen is there will be some division. Take your Bible and turn to John chapter 7. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, a Bible reader, a Bible reader and a Bible believer and try to practice it, it will separate you. It will divide you from some people, from maybe a lot of people. <laughs> but it will divide you to some, some point. It, it just will. Uh, just just associating yourself with Jesus Christ will set you apart from some people. Look in John 7 quickly, verse 43. So there was a division among the people because of Him. Talking about Christ. When Christ shows up, there's going to be a division. You, you can't stay neutral. We'll get to that later. But uh, there will be a division. Uh, it just, it just it always works that way. Look in John chapter 9, same book. John chapter 9, a couple pages to the right. John 9, verse number 16. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not a God, because he keeps not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Why? Because of Christ. It doesn't make any difference. Look at chapter 10. <clears throat> How hard you try not to. If, if you're trying not to, I've just gotten to the point where I just don't care anymore. <laughs> You need to get to that point as quick as you can. Amen. I'm not talking about, you know, uh, separating yourself from the world where you can't be a witness or anything like that. But I'm just saying, you might as well expect some people are going to keep you at arm's length. The closer you get to God, the further away they want you from them. Amen. Look in John chapter 10, look at verse 19. There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings, and it was for Christ's sayings, and so on and so forth. Uh, when Jesus Christ shows up, there's always 
Always. There's always a division, especially if you're going to be uh, a, Bible, a Bible believer. And um, that ought not bother you so much. I'm amazed at how, I mean, if you're young and so on and so forth, and I, I can understand why maybe that may bother some people, but I, like I said, I've gotten just to the point where I, just, I, I don't care anymore. Um, I want to I live for God. I want to be pleasing to the Lord. Uh, this is my crowd, amen. And uh, this is the direction we're going, and that's the direction I'm going. And I want to be on the Lord's side and all that. So when, when Jesus Christ shows up, there's, there's a division. There's a division there. The Lord makes a division between uh, His people and the, and the nation of Israel, or excuse me, the, and the Egyptians over there in Exodus chapter 8. He makes a division between them. He wants people to know there's a division. Turn over and look at that. I know we're running some references, but that's okay. Look Quickly, come to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8. God will do this. Exodus chapter 8. Notice verse 23. Notice the Lord's words here. You can see where he says there, verse 22, they'll know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Look at verse 23. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. Of course, he's in here talking to Pharaoh and all that. And uh, he's telling them, I'm going to put a division. I was telling some of the men yesterday. I remember growing up, uh, being in this church, and I remember hearing the preacher preach, and he'd say, get you some tracks. Get you some tracks and pass them out. So I, you know, I, I got me some tracks, and I put them in my pocket. If I had a, po a shirt that had a pocket on, I, I stuck them right there in that pocket, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'd, I'd take them to school, <laughs> and I'd have them right there in that pocket. And of course, I didn't have a code on. Maybe sometimes I did or didn't. I'd have them right there in that pocket. And I'd leave them, you know, leave them here, and I'd leave them there, and I'd leave them in the bathroom or whatever. But you know how it is with kids, maybe sometimes. I just didn't quite have enough boldness to just give it to someone. You know what I'm talking about? Amen? That's, that's normal. That's flesh. That's human, right? Yeah. Buck, buck, buck. That was me. And, uh, you know, so, but, I, but I kept them right there, you know. Got them right there. I'm trying. Making an effort just ain't quite there yet. And finally, one of my one of my buddies, he noticed that. He never said nothing until one day he kept noticing that, and he looked. And finally, one day, in front of a bunch of people, he said, "Hey, what you got in your pocket? What? What?" And he said, "Right there in your pocket. What is it? Aren't those aren't those some kind of Bible tracks or something?" And he walked over and he said, aren't you supposed to pass these out? And he took them out of my pocket. He started passing them out. You know what God was doing? He was making a division between me and the lost people. And when God does that, don't get mad at God. Just accept it. And trust Him. Amen. Now I know that's a maybe a real simple illustration, but how many times how many times has God, gentlemen, how many times has God done that to you at work? It might not be tracks, it might be somebody there, four or five guys talking, and you know, you know, conversation really isn't some things that you would say and some words you wouldn't use, and all of a sudden now the spotlight turns to you. What do you think about that? Hey, aren't you a Christian? What's the Bible say about that? What do you guys believe down at your church? What do you believe about that? Up, 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 up. You know what God's doing? He's making a division. The Bible will divide. If you're going to read that Bible and you're going to practice that Bible, I'm telling you something, it's going to show in your life. It'll show on your face. It'll show in your countenance. It'll show. And it will make a, a natural division will take place, a supernatural, but it's it just, with God, it's just natural. <laughs> the Bible divides. Now, I'll say two things about division. Um, number one, and I don't know if I have to say much about this here tonight, but uh, the Bible will divide when it comes to the doctrine, to doctrine. There's no question that that we, put, we try to put emphasis on doctrine. 
uh, with purpose, with reason. I, I know that's not all there is to preach uh, and teach. I understand that. There's the practical side of things. I was asking the men on the way home from the prison the other day. I said, you think I'm over these guys' heads? Uh, do you think I ought to, and, 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 and kind of got quiet in the car for a second. And sometimes uh, that can happen. I mean, we've been blessed. Listen, we take for granted some of the things we say that we know as far as doctrinal things. We take for granted. Not everybody knows that stuff. And it's not that we're some great thing. It's just we've been given some light. That's all. And praise God for it and those kind of things. And I know there's a place to, to preach and teach that. And I know, listen, I know the good, good doctrine will produce, will, will produce good living. You've got to have that balance. But this crowd today, they want to throw the doctrine out. And they'll tell you, we, want, we, don't want, we don't want to preach that because it divides. Well, that's why we want it. That's why we want it. That's why we don't take Baptist off the sign out there. That's right. That, that's, why we don't, that's why we stand for a King James Bible. And that's why we preach what we preach. Because there's some things, listen, this may sound, as odd as it sounds, there's, there is some, what do you want to call it? There's some things we don't want in here. Amen. Just flat don't want it. And you want to get it right, leave it out the door, leave it out there, repent, get some things right, fine. But we're going to make no apologies for when it comes to properly trying to make proper division, especially in doctrinal matters. Take your Bible, come to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. You're familiar with these passages as well. It might not be when you hear the chapter given, but when you hear the verse, I know you will be. Isaiah chapter 28. How do you learn doctrine? Well, this will tell you right here. How do you learn doctrine? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Question mark. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little... And there a little. You know what it is? It's read the book, read the book, compare verse with verse, compare scripture with scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Here a little, there a little. It's not all at one, one lump sh sum and one big lump shot. It takes, it takes time to grow. It takes time to learn uh, sound doctrine, and that, there's, um, there's importance with sound doctrine, uh, doctrine. You ought to try to learn sound doctrine. Take your Bible and come to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy <clears throat> chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Don't be lazy. Open your Bible. Turn it over there. 1 Timothy. Amen. Somebody say amen, please. Amen. I know how it is when you're sitting in the pew there. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy 1, I'm already there, I'm going to begin reading verse 3. 1 Timothy 1, 3, look at verse 3. And I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, Paul, watch him, that they teach no other, what is it? Doctrine. Look at verse 10. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves of mankind, for men stealers, liars, perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound Doctrine, sound doctrine. Look at 4 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. We're seeing that. Giving heed to seducing spirits. We're seeing that. And doctrines, doctrines of devils. If you're preaching and teaching sound doctrine, you won't have, they won't, you won't, uh, well, anyway, you won't have that. Look at verse, um, verse 6. Verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good, good doctrine. Cross the page. Look at verse uh, 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Do you think Paul's concerned about doctrine? I think he is. Look at chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and 
doctrine. We saw this this morning, verse, chapter 6, verse 1. Let as many as servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of, of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. I could go on. Look at verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Look at 2 Timothy. Are you still with me? 2 Timothy. I'm just showing you something. 2 Timothy chapter 3. All these guys, you know, well, you make too much of it. No, we don't. We probably don't make enough of it. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. Look at 3.16. All scriptures give inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine. Number one, the first issue is doctrine. The first issue when preaching and teaching is doctrine. Amen. You can't, if you can't get your doctrine right, uh, you're gonna, you may have a hard time with salvation. You better get your doctrine right first. Chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering, and doctrine. 4, 3, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Titus chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that uh, he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and to convince, look at that thing, the gainsayers. Some of you, you're rooted in good, solid, sound doctrine. There ain't no gainsayer going to blow you out of it. Well, praise the Lord for that. Amen. Let me give you one nine there. Look at 2.11. 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all, teaching us the nine ungodliness. Let's see. Uh, it's not there. I think I got the wrong reference. There's others. Look at um, 10. I get the wrong. Yeah, not prolonging, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine. There it is. Of God, our Savior in all things. Uh, come with me to, uh, there's a couple more there, but come with me to uh, Hebrews 13. Do you see the importance? I'm just trying to show you the importance of, of doctrine and the preaching and the teaching. Of, of sound doctrine. Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. I'll say this, and I'll move on. Come back to 1 Kings here. When Brother Wheeler was here, we got talking about some stuff, just he and I. And he told me, he was talking about some different things, and he said, you know, there's a movement, there's a, there's a little bit of an undercurrent going on right now in a Bible-believing crowd. I said, really? He said, I said, what is it? And he said, it's these young guys looking for something new. Always looking for something new. He said, I'm not talking about not studying and God not showing you some things and all that. He said, but I'm, he said, I'm talking about some new thing as far as a doctrinal thing. You better be careful with that one. You better be careful with that one. Listen, I, I, know, I know the Bible is an inexhaustible book, and as long as you keep reading it, God will keep showing you stuff. But as far as the, the foundational doctrines that's given to the New Testament Christian, you're not going to improve on that. You're not going to improve on that. You're not going to come up with some new doctrine that, that nobody's ever seen. It, 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 you're just not going to do it. I don't believe you're going to do it. And what happens is uh, uh, these guys get fooling around with this stuff, and if they ain't careful, they get wound up and get carried away with false doctrine because they think they've got something that, that nobody else has had. I got something that Dr. Ruckman didn't see. Well, so what? It's God's book. I understand the, uh, the whole thing of it and all that, but, but man, that wrong, wrong motive, wrong attitude. What are, you, what are you doing with it? Okay, God gave you something. What are you going to do with that? I mean, you going to give that to some baby Christian? Is it going to edify the body of Christ? I'll say this, a lot, watch me, a lot, and I know Dr. Rubman had some books out there and things kind of wild and crazy stuff and all that, but the majority of what that man put out edified the body of Christ. And it, and it established the Christian on the Word of God and gave him a foundation that was unmovable and unshakable. 
That's what you want, not this wild, crazy stuff. Amen. What's that? He upheld proper division and uh, doctrine. Doctrine will divide. It's important. I'm going to say this. Look here. Uh, if you're back in 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, you know, verse 25 there, that the sword definitely divides. He, and the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. What a wild thing to say. But obviously there's a motive behind it. Notice verse 26, Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. You know what it does? It shows where your devotion is. The Bible will divide you in such a way, it will show you where your devotion is. It will show you where your loyalty is. This book and the preaching of this book will, will manifest and will show you where your devotion is. Is it going to be devoted to God's Word? I said this morning, listen folks, and I don't even like talking about this. I don't even like saying it. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you as I'm standing here, I hope we don't have to. But as sure as I'm standing here, it's already, it's already happening as far as that goes. This issue of homosexuality and all that stuff. You're going to have to, it's been going on, but you're going, more and more, you're going to have to deal with it in your family. Whether close or far. Whether close or distant. And it may be, listen, and the farther this thing goes, listen, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you, it'll creep up, it might be, it might be a son, it might be a daughter. It might be a cousin. It might be a grandson. It might be a granddaughter. I hate. I shudder to even think about. It. I got grandkids, and I, I hate to even think that some stinking lousy pervert would would pervert their judgment and and sway them into something so so hideous and abominable. Amen. And you're go listen. And you're going to have to make some decisions on what you're going to do and how you're going to handle it. Are you going to say, okay, you know, well, or is it still an abomination? I mean, I, we're sitting here in church, and I'm not discounting anybody saying amen or nothing like that, but it's easier said than done here than it is when you're sitting there across the table looking at it. Yeah, amen. God help us. God help us. I don't even like to think about that stuff. But you know what it'll do? You know what the Bible will do? You'll find out where your devotion is. You can't have both. How can you have both? We were saying the other day, what, in a joking manner, but what concord hath Christ with Belial? What fellowship hath light with darkness? That stuff is darkness. Amen. Amen. Now, I know that's a, you know, and I'm trying to get on a hobby horse and kick that stuff and all that. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just pointing something out here. The Bible will it'll 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 uh, it'll 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 uh, flush you out. As I was saying before, the tracks in my pocket. You know what? You know what God was doing. Not only was there creating a division, but He was going to find out where my devotion was. Was I going to take a back seat, run hide in a corner somewhere, and never? Never put tracks back in that pocket again. That was way too much, way too embarrassing. Or am I going to go ahead and see and say, okay, God, if somebody laughs or whatever, that's fine. I'll, I'll take that reproach for you. God's going to see where devotion is. The Bible will flush out your devotion. That book... How do you know that book's not written? How do you know that book is written by God and not just man? <laughs> Are you kidding me? It sure doesn't. It, uh, there's places there where it sure doesn't make man look very good. And there's places there where it goes against your grain and your flesh and mine. Yes, even ours. Okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to submit to it? Are you going to skip over that and move on or? It'll show you where your devotion is. You know what sometimes is hard to do? 
I look around this room and many of you, you've been going at this a while now, a long time. And all of a sudden, in your Christian life, and we preach it all the time, when you grow, you change. Amen? And you're growing and growing, and you're in that book, and all of a sudden, one day, you come across something. All of a sudden, now, it dawns on you, God is wanting you to make some changes. Okay, where's your devotion going to be? <laughs> Are you going to follow through with it? I'm talking about maybe some major things. Are you going to follow through with it? That book will, will flush out your devotion, where your loyalty is. Where your love is, that book will flush it out. Every time. When that sword comes out, <laughs> the one woman says, Oh, no, please don't, 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 don't hurt my baby. Her loyalty showed just like that. <laughs> Go ahead, cut him in half. Her loyalty showed. Her devotion showed just like that. That book will surface it. It'll point it out. All right, so this book divides. It divides uh, doctrine. It divides in devotional matters as well. And then look at notice verse 27. Verse 27, then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. That goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. The Bible gives discernment. The Bible gives discernment. The Bible will give discernment in hard circumstances. I'm not saying God will blaze it across the sky. I'm not saying that God, and you may not have to search and dig and spend some, excuse me, some time with, with the Lord concerning certain matters and maybe private matters and but the Bible is a discerner. Not only does it discern your heart and all that, but it gives discernment. This book is a discerner. We've quote, trying to quote the verse and all that several times and all that, but flip over there, come to Hebrews. We'll look at the verse. Come to Hebrews chapter 4. Great verse. I want you to look at it. Maybe you can even mark it. <coughs> Flip to it, maybe give you a time to mark it and all that. But uh, the, the Bible is a discerner, and the Bible will give discernment. It will help you distinguish truth from a lie, right from wrong. The Word of God reveals uh, truth. Uh, in do, and in doing so, revealing truth, revealing truth will reveal a lie. When truth is revealed, the lie is also exposed. So the Bible gives discernment in distinguishing truth from a lie. The Bible is a discerner and showing difference. And, but notice here, verse, verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful. That quick means made alive. It's powerful. Don't underestimate the power of God's Word. The power of God's Word. You realize it, this book shakes kingdoms. It persuades kings and dictators and, and uh, one way or the other. Uh, it's hated, it's despised, it's loved, and it's cherished. It's a powerful book. This book has an impact everywhere it goes. Everywhere it goes, the Bible has an impact. I, I, I'm a firm believer in it. The open air preaching, public preaching, and the words of God going out, and the printed the printed uh, Word of God publicly going out. I'm a firm believer in it. It has power. It has effect. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of, of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner, look at it, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, it's one thing to say that the Bible is a discerner of your thoughts. That's one thing. That, I mean, that's, that's enough in and of itself. But to say the Bible is a discerner of the intents of your heart, that's, that's something else. Not only does the Bible can discern your thoughts, but it can discern your motives, man, your intentions, your intents. The Bible, the, Bible, the Bible has man pegged. 
The Bible knows man. And what is it? More so than anything. I mean, this is a living book, but it's the Spirit of God that knows man through the Bible. And he'll work on man. He'll deal with man. He'll deal with his heart. He's a discerner of his heart. He will expose his heart. He will get inside of his heart. And he'll talk to him. It's a discerner. He'll distinguish truth from a lie. Come back to 1 Kings. And it, distingu- it does. It distinguishes truth. From a lie, from these two women. One was lying, one was telling the truth. It shows shows difference. Shows difference and shows difference in and people, shows difference in and motives. It shows difference in the intents and all that. You see that in verse 26. The Bible is a discerner. Don't ever underestimate the Bible. When you fellas preach, preach the Bible. Why? Because listen, when I'm preaching, I'm aiming for your heart. I may throw some things out there, try to and all that. I'm not smart enough to appeal to maybe your intellect and all that. But I can sure hit your heart. Because I got a book that can hit your heart. You might score higher on me, uh, higher than me, some IQ test or whatever. I'm not concerned about that. I really don't care about that. Because I got a book. And I'm aiming right for your heart. Preach to the heart. Preach to the heart. God is interested in your heart. I've quoted the verse many times. You don't know the verse, but he said, Son, give me thine heart. Let thine eyes observe my ways. The song says, Here's my heart, O Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God wants your heart. My son, keep thine heart with all diligence, for out of it are the what issues of life. I can't remember now, I had looked it up at one time, the word heart, I think it was the word heart, and I forget how many times it shows up, I think that depending on how many pages you have in your Bible, it almost matched the number of pages in the average Bible. What are you saying? I'm saying God is aiming at your heart on every page. Although it may not be there, the principle, what I'm trying to say, is there. God is interested in your heart. He's interested in your heart. And this book is a discerner. And it will give you discernment. I'll say this, you need discernment. You need need godly discernment. You need that. We need that in the day and age in which we live. I'm telling you right now, this is not the same, this ain't the same crowd that we was looking at 20 years ago. I ain't talking about this crowd. I'm talking about that crowd. It ain't the same crowd. You need discernment in how to deal with certain issues and situations and circumstances. And, and, and we got kids being born right now, little ones right now walking in the back door. You need discernment. You've got to have discernment. If there's ever a time when we need discernment, it, it is now. This whole issue, I don't even bring it up, but this whole issue of COVID and vaccines and all that, Listen, I, you want to vaccinate, vaccinate. I'm not, I don't care. If I don't want to, I'm not going to. But don't look at me cross-eyed if, I'm not, if, if I don't or if I do. Amen. Amen, that's my decision between me and God. I mean, come on. These, uh, and, and I know, look, I've, I've read the stuff. I've seen some of the stuff, maybe not even as much as you have. Need discernment. And see, right now, some of it, I can tell he ain't got no discernment. How do you know? You don't, listen, you sitting here looking across the aisle in the next pew, you don't know what people are facing. You don't know everything about them. You don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know, listen, I know, I know men that their doctors told them not to get it. What do you do with that? Well, my doctor told me to get it, okay? Well, I would change change doctors. Well, he would say the same thing. It's nuts. This is nuts. What are you saying? You better get some discernment. So what am I I telling you? Get in that book. Find out what God would have you to do. Amen. Amen. 
I, listen, I believe that. I know there's some preachers, they don't agree with what I'm telling you right now at all. They, they, they would tell me, bless God, you need to get up there and you need to warn your people, you need to tell them this, you need to tell them that. No! To, that's not a spiritual matter! That's between you and God and your house and your husband and your wife. Your family. That's right. Amen. Amen. I'll amen that. Amen. You need some discernment. Maybe I'm beating a dead horse with that, but that still needs to be said. That stuff is still going on, and sometimes I've watched the brethren. The look goes across the room. Maybe not in here, but I, the, you can almost see the wheels turning. You know, the hamster begins to run. <laughs> amen. Need some discernment. The Bible is a discerner. The Bible gives a discerner. Number three, number three, and I'm trying to hurry. Number three, the Bible is a deterrent. <laughs> and maybe this kind of goes hand in hand here, but the Bible is a deterrent from, from deception and from destruction. Look at verse 28. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him. To do judgment. I realize Solomon gets messed up later on, and we, he went a whoring after other gods and everything else. Well, he got away from God, and I understand all that. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you with this: if you stay with this book, you stay with the sword. It's a deterrent to keep you, to keep you from deception, and and in turn, that'll keep you from destruction. What are you saying? I'm saying, man, you, the sword, the sword of the Word of God, the sword of truth, of truth will be a deterrent to keep you and will keep you from deception and destruction. And then I want to say it'll keep you from maybe as a person, as a home, as a church, as a community, a country, a nation from declining and decay or a society. So how do you say that? Well, I mean, all Israel saw that. All Israel saw that. They took note of that. Notice what they, and they feared the king. They feared the king. Look at verse 28. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him. They feared him. God established him. He established him with a sword. <laughs> in more ways than one. But he established him in truth with wisdom that went with that and understanding that went with that that like they had never seen before. And I'm telling you, in 2021, that book will establish you. It'll make you different. And it'll keep you from declining. It'll keep you from decay like the rest of this society. Have, what was the last time you was out there and you just stopped and looked? I'm not talking about necessarily in a condescending way, but I'm just, I just examine people and examine, examine their habits and examine their morality. Just take a good look. I'll tell you right now, you take a young lady who's 18, 19, who fears God and is in her Bible, she'll stand out. God will preserve her from some destruction. God, you take a young man who's in that book and seeking God's face and God's will, he'll be different. He'll be different than the average, average male out there at 25. Say, why? This Bible, this Bible makes, makes individuals out of people, but this, this Bible will make a man out of you. This Bible will make a lady out of you. And I've said it before, but we got, we got, and maybe, is the, I understand there's all kinds of, of reasoning and effects and cause and effect and all that stuff, but we got guys that are 30 years old, man, they're acting like they're 15. I'm not kidding you. I'm not stretching the truth. I'm not exaggerating. You look at it and you go, I, I don't get it. You're 30. You're 27, you're 25, you're acting like you're 14. Right? You know, what, you know what the problem is? No sword. 
to take a young man who's got the sword and get that sword out. He'll study that sword. He'll exercise with that sword. He'll have some discernment. There'll be some deterrent there from declining, from deception, from destruction, etc., etc. <clears throat> number five, and I'm going to be done. Number five. Number five, you still with me? Almost done. Verses 25 and 26 here. You know what the Word of God will do, and I've kind of touched on this already, but uh, we'll mention it in closing. Uh, the Word of God, the sword, will will it, it'll make you <clears throat> excuse me. It'll make you make a decision. It'll force you to make a decision. It won't make the decision for you, but it'll force you to make a decision. You cannot be neutral with God. You cannot ride the fence and expect God to just turn His head and allow you to do whatever it is you're doing or, or not to do whatever it is you should do, etc. Uh, it, it forces a decision. And you see that in verse 25, 26 there? She couldn't stand it. She had to make a decision. She had to say something. It compelled her to do that. That book will expose your heart in such a way you will make a decision. You can't get around it. That's why the Bible is hated. That's why, the, that's why men don't like the Bible. That's why, that's why Christians don't like to read it. It forces you to make some decisions. You have to be honest with yourself, and you have to make some decisions. That book will talk to you. I don't know how that sounds to people. He's nuts. A book talks to him. Well, this one does. And it'll force you to make a decision. Now listen, from the depths of one's heart. From the depths of one's heart. This book will, it'll, it'll, deal, it'll get way down in there. That's unlike any other book you've ever seen. It'll go way deep down in there. Down in there where nobody else knows. Down in there where nobody else can see. And maybe that's good or bad or whatever. I don't really care right now. But I'm just saying, that book, will, will, it'll go deep. It will go deep and it'll make you. It'll force you. To make a decision and then force you to make a decision concerning the declaration of judgment sometimes you'll have to make a judgment I'm tired of the world telling you know you can't judge you're not supposed to judge you can't get a new one get a new one we know that that's bogus I hope you know that's bogus you can't judge the Bible says judge not Oh, finish the verses. Do you even know where it's at in the Bible instead of just parroting somebody all the time? You better learn how to make judgments. If you read the Bible, you will make judgments. Amen. That guy's a turkey. How do you know? I don't know. Just He don't line up with the Bible. That's what I was saying this morning. The guy I listened to on the radio coming to the prayer meeting yesterday morning. He's a, he's a screwball. He's a turkey. Why? Because he don't line up with the Bible. Well, you can't, how can you say that? I mean, it doesn't matter. It is, it's not based on any information as far as knowledge that I have. It's based on this information and the knowledge that's found in this book. You can make a judgment. I always like to, th I always like to throw it back. Paul says, "Ye which are spiritual judgeth all things. Okay, what are you going to do with that? Now see what you, you have Christian people telling you, and you can't be judging you. you that's, we, in some people's eyes, we're branded as a judgmental church. Your preaching is judgmental. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you. I'm, not, I'm not trying to be arrogant with that at all. But where it should be judgmental, amen. Amen. You're judging me. Well, you got something wrong? I, the preacher been preaching this stuff for years. I'm going to keep preaching it. Because the longer you go, you better not get soft pedaling on it. You need, you need to hold to it. And not let this world indoctrinate you and into, into in believe in something that's not true. You better keep making judgments. 
righteous judgments. The old preacher used to say, if you have to make a judgment, judge righteously and judge mercifully. Amen. Yeah, because when it goes around, it comes around. You reap what you sow, all that, amen. But you better learn how to make a judgment. You make a judgment all the time. You go to the grocery store. I do. That's a bad apple. That's a good one. I'll take the good one. I made a judgment. Boy, that, no, that's not, no. I'm walking down, the, down the, the, the road or down through the parking lot, and here comes this guy, and he's got a hoodie up, and it's down to here, and it's dark, and he's acting kind of squirrely. I'm not going to fool around with him. I just made a judgment. He's bad news. And if you say, well, then, yeah, 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 okay, you're, you're what we call victims. <laughs> that's, tr- that's true. Well, you should, you know, you should give him a chance. You should love him. You love him. You give him a chance. I'll preach to him from a distance. Yeah. Make a paper airplane and fly it to him. Stick it on his car or something. Amen. Guys coming down the road, look shady, acting funny in a store. Ladies, you better pay attention to me. They're out there. You better learn how to make a judgment. You teach your kids that all the time. What do we say? Stranger danger. Why? You just taught them how to judge. And that's a good thing. Talk to to Brother Jim. He'll tell you certain parts of town you shouldn't be in. Why? He made a judgment based on experience. Lots of it. Yeah, amen. Amen. I've been, and maybe some of you, maybe this is nothing new, but I've been in prison long enough where when I'm on the outside, I can spot the mentality. I look at a guy and I go, that guy right there, that, he's got prison mentality. And if he ain't careful or if he's not been there, he's going there. He's headed there. Well, you shouldn't judge. Are you kidding? If it was my boy, I'd be trying to correct that. You better make a judgment. You better be able to spot something. And you better have enough brass and backbone about you to do something about it. It ain't got nothing to do with loving and letting them express themselves. Are you kidding me? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I'm done. I guess I'm just venting right now. But some of that stuff you, you need to hear. And I know sometimes it may come across. It comes across maybe... Uh, hard and all that. And it's not necessarily meant to be and all that, but it's meant to get your attention. You need somebody that, we need to be jolted every now and then. What, this world is wrong. This world's philosophy is wrong. You understand? It's flat, dead wrong. <laughs> you need a sword in your hand. You're a Christian soldier of Jesus Christ. You're told to know how to use your weapon and don't be afraid to use it and cursed be he that withdraweth his sword. How's it go? Keepeth his sword from blood. You ought to know how to use that book and don't be afraid to swing it. Amen. And this crowd, when you do, and when you do, when that sword comes out, they'll know it because, man, it comes through there and it's sharper than any two-edged sword like a razor blade. It's just... It just cuts anything in its path. So what do you do? You just let her, you just let the word of God do what it wants to do. Amen. Now, we'll recap, we'll be done. The effects, I'm talking about the effects of the sword. It's a divider, it's a discerner, it's a deterrent, and it forces a decision. Read your Bible. Study your sword. Know your sword. We have, it goes without saying. It sounds so redundant to even say it. What a great book. What a great gift that God would give us. A book like this. I'm, I'm glad he likens it to a sword. I know he likens it to a hammer. He likens it to fire. And as we're preaching this morning, he likens it to water and all that. He likens it to bread. I mean, and the list can go on and on. But I'm glad he likens it to a sword. 
You need a sword. What good's a soldier? What good's a Christian soldier without a sword? Without God's sword? You're going to right there and hit him with your shield? You're going to chest bump him on you with your blessed parade of righteousness? Your good life? Boom. Look at me. Look how I'm living. He can already see that. You need a sword. You need the Word of God. I'm not saying you ought to be a scholar, but you ought to know some of that. I know, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Some of you have been saved for 35 years. You ought to know that book. Some of you have been saved a little while. Okay, here a little, there a little. But the guy's been saved 35, he's still picking it up. A little here a little, and there a little. Amen. What a treasure. Man, don't neglect it. Don't neglect it. Read it. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. I can, we'll just repeat and go on, but.